All right. Can we go home, or anybody got any questions? <laughs> Sorry, at the back first. Yep. Sorry, can you up and loud? It's very, very difficult. And that is partly because people are confirmed in their bias. How do you talk to a member of the NRA who votes Trump? I really don't think it's very easy. But then they would say, how do you talk about a leftist Democrat? And increasingly, we're polarized. We don't talk to each other. I think the first thing to start is to by listening, by trying to listen to where they are. And very often, if you do, they begin to get into difficulties of defending their own position. But not necessarily going to work with the NRA, because their answer is the way to avoid killing is to arm teachers to the teeth and to have more guns. And I, I, I think it is tricky. And I think one of my many regrets about Heathrop is I do think it was something that was trying to address this. And the death of Heathrop is not just the death of another college, it's the death of something very special. And so, not easy. I think showing somebody something is actually quite important. Don't underestimate how much people judge you, not by what you say, but by who you are. Yeah. And I think many of the great teachers at Heathrop are great not just because of what they knew, actually maybe less that, but because of who they are. And I think that's what communicated to a lot of people. Sorry, there's somebody else. Go. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, this talk. It was fantastic. Uh, I can't agree with you more. So, I just want to bring back to the signs of the times we've established we're in a post-truth world. We've also established that there are definitely embers of this fire that we have and we need to do something with them. I wondered if you could perhaps talk slightly more, perhaps, in the vein of this course for uh, energy distribution globally, what you would like to see uh, the embers of the college do. It depends where you are. I think that if we're teachers, we've got to try not just to fight to maintain our subjects, but to try to show the relevance of what we're doing more broadly. I think the way PHSE is taught in a lot of schools is dire. I think putting condoms and bananas at the age of 13 isn't very helpful. I think we need to be showing people what love is about. And I actually think many of us have the resources to talk about what it means to be human. And maybe using videos and films are about that. I think we have a responsibility to go out to adults. I bemoan the fact that so many clergy do very little in the way of adult education. I think some clergy expect people to turn their brains off when they go into church. And things like Alpha are all very well for some, but I actually think what we're doing here, the sort of things that we could put on in parishes could excite people. If it's open-minded, if it's a genuine opportunity, people want to address these questions. My impression, if you talk to parents of children who have done the sort of things we've been doing for the last 20 years at school, is to say, I wish I could have done that. I would like to do this. So I think we've got to try and find ways, wherever we are, of trying to communicate. And it isn't easy. I'm a chartered accountant as well. And if you're a chartered accountant's office, it's not that straightforward. Sometimes it means taking a stand. And sometimes it means taking a stand and saying, no, I'm sorry, this is wrong. And the trouble is, increasingly, the idea of something being wrong has gone. When I trained to be a chartered accountant, you had to sign a set of accounts saying it had a true and fair view. And I remember as a partner agonizing as to whether the accounts were. Now there is a rule book that thick, and you've got lawyers lined up on both sides. And if I was an accountant threatening to um, qualify a set of accounts, the lawyers would be on and saying, where precisely and what is the wording that allows you to do it? So the ethical idea is undermined. I'm sorry to be indirect, but I think we've got to find ways of showing. And I think that's going to vary, and it isn't easy. None of it's easy. Um, it's more of a comment than a question. Um, I did your, as you know, your course on Kierkegaard. Um, when you were talking about indirect communication, I'm also conscious that Kierkegaard talked of doubly reflective communication. And I think in one place, I think it's in the um, upbuilding discourses and have certain on marriage. He talks about what he's trying to communicate, and he says what you're trying to communicate is capacity. You can live this life, which is where the double reflection comes from, reflecting God and reflecting the person to whom you're communicating. And it seems to me that one of the things that he thought did was that communication of capacity, and that may be 
I think, what we need in a post-truth society. I would like to use a different expression also from Kierkegaard, and that is the difference between possibility and necessity. I think many of us feel in the grip of necessity. Things cannot be otherwise. It can lead to depression, it can lead to despair. We're caught in a cycle. Things cannot be otherwise. Possibility says no. Maybe Peter Singer is right. Maybe we are just animals. Maybe if you've got a full-term baby and it's badly disabled, kill it and have another one. Makes complete sense. But maybe he's wrong. Maybe there is a broader capacity of what it is to be human. One of my nervousnesses about AI is that instead of us aspiring to become what we're capable of being, we're increasingly aspiring to be rather like AI. It's going in the opposite direction. So I would like to say that it is trying to communicate the capacity of what it is to be human. I remember coming away from my meeting with Freddie Copleston thinking, I wish I could be like that. And now at the end of my life, I have not succeeded. <laughs> and I wish I could have done. So I, you know, I, I, I take what you're saying. It's trying to show the new car, the new mobile phone, the new sexy partner is not actually going to bring satisfaction and trying to get them to think a bit more deeply. But it's very, very hard. I don't pretend it's not hard. But then it wasn't hard. 2,000 years ago. It was hard 2,000 years ago. I'm conscious of Simon. We've got two, time for two more, I think. No, we're really asleep. Okay. Can I just suggest that Margaret Beaufort's behaviour was one of those flames. Um, it offers wonderful fellowship. Um, and I was Thank you very much indeed. Useful. Very useful. There, there are other places. Um, you know, the more we can hear, hear, share about them, the better. Thank you. More. Any more? Yep. Um, your assessment of GCSE, RE and the like, I have to, I was the former National RE advisor, so I won't comment. <laughs> but I think your voice and your mind is going to be necessary um, in the middle of August when the first set of results well, I have to say, if you look at the specifications and the marked boundaries, I cannot believe that anybody is going to get decent grades at all because they're so demanding. My guess is they'll mark on the curve and they cannot afford to have too many lousy grades. So my guess is that's what they'll do. The grade boundaries may be one thing. The trouble is GCSE used to motivate people to do what we're doing. It used to encourage them to want to do A-level. The other thing that changed, I didn't mention earlier, was there used to be four A-levels, and people would take RS as a fourth if they were doing medicine, and then, or something else, and then they would choose to go on because they were so fascinated. Now most schools have moved to three. So I do think we've got a challenge, and I think in an educational world where money is tight, heads are concerned with finance, all the wins are against us. That doesn't mean we haven't got to fight. Thank you very much for being here.